The topic for lecture 4 is differentiation of functions of one variable. In this, the first module, we'll briefly introduce the concept of limits which we need for later discussion. Next we'll go through some of the theory behind differentiation in a fairly informal way and we'll finish up with the basic rules of differentiation. Before we discuss differentiation we need to touch on the topic of limits but just enough to get the discussion going. Here we have a function f of x is equal to e to the x minus 1 divided by x. We can see that that function isn't defined for x equals 0. f0 is equal to e to the 0 which is 1 minus 1 on 0. So our function is well and truly undefined at x equals 0. What about numbers close to 0 though? We can evaluate the function as we approach 0 from below, from the negative side, or from above, the positive side. So here we have x equals 0, the function is undefined then. If we look at the approximate values of f of x, as we get closer and closer to 0, from above 0 0.1, 0 0.001, 0 0 0.0001, we've got f of x there, not to three decimal places, but if we increase the precision, we would see these values never actually equaled 1. They would get very, very close, but they would never get there. And the same for when we approach 0 from below. That is, our function e to the x minus 1 over x approaches 1 as x approaches 0. Or more formally, in terms of limits, the limit of our function as x approaches 0 is equal to 1. So limits tell us what happens to a function as we approach a certain value of the variable, in this case x. We came across this concept in side diagrams in lecture 1. Putting those ideas together, the limit is a number that depends on the value of fx as x values get close to some value a, but it doesn't tell us what happens at precisely x equals a. Remember, when we compute the limit, we look at how we approach A from both sides, from below and from above. Here are some graphs that are examples of limits. Our variables are V and Q, and it's the value of V when we have our limit. So the first one was a similar case to the one we just looked at. Here we have a ch an abrupt change in direction, and C and D show distinct discontinuities. Remember we looked at asymptotic functions in lecture 2. We could spend much more time on limits, but that's about all we need for now. Differentiation is about how functions change. Calculus was developed independently in the 17th century by both Newton and Leibniz while they were studying the motion of planets around the Sun. We can also determine the slope of a function at any point uh, using differentiation. We can only differentiate functions over intervals in which they are both continuous and smooth. And here we have two of the most common ways of designating a derivative. If our function is f of x, then we can have f prime x. Or if say our function is uh, y equals uh, some function of x, then we have the familiar dy dx. Let's look at the basics. We want to determine the slope of a function. Well, we'll start with a linear function. That's the simplest type of function. The slope is the same at any point along the function. The slope is the change in y over the change in x, or y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And for a linear function, it's the same any point on the function. So we could have delta y and delta x there, or there, or there. So it's quite simple to find the slope of a linear function. It's not so simple with nonlinear functions, but we can apply the same principle. We can apply the same principle by thinking about the slope of the tangent to the function. Here the tangent at x equals a is tp, but we only know one point on the tangent. So let's draw a sequent pq. We can determine the slope of the sequent. In this case, delta y on delta x is f of a plus h minus f of a. So it's delta y, uh, divided by h, 
which is just AH minus A. Now we have two points, so we can apply our slope formula, but we see that the slope of the sequence isn't really close to the slope of the tangent PT. But as we let H become smaller and smaller, then the slope of PQ approaches the slope of PT. This is the intuition behind differentiation, and this is where limits enter the picture. Here we have the formal definition of the first root of, of a function. It's called the Newton quotient. Newton got his name on the quotient, but we mostly use Leibniz notation. Basically, it's the slope formula, where we take the limit as h approaches zero. So we have h getting smaller, and that's our first root of. Another way we could think of that is dy dx is equal to, well, delta y on delta x, but the limit as delta x approaches zero. It's another way of putting it. Later in the lecture, we'll learn various rules of differentiation. We can derive all of these rules using the Newton quotient and some algebra. Well, we could do that, but you won't have to in this course. This is how we would find the derivative of a function from first principles. So we have our point A. We add h to A and compute the function at uh, f of A plus h. Compute the Newton quotient, simplify, and solve for the, uh, the limit as h approaches zero. Once we have the slope, we can use our point slope formula that we came across earlier to find the slope of the tangent to the function at point A. Remember our point slope formula? It's y minus y1 is equal to a times x minus x1, where in this case a is the slope. Pause this video now and have a look at the video for example 1. Now just to recap um, when a function is differentiable, a function must be continuous and we have a continuity condition here. So if the limit as x approaches x0 of f of x is actually f of x0, then the function is continuous. If we apply that test to our first example, we would find that wasn't the case. Remember at x equals zero, that earlier function was undefined. So we didn't have continuity there. But not all continuous functions are differentiable. They must also be uh, smooth. Uh, for example, y equals the absolute value of x isn't differentiable at x equals naught. If we have our axes there, y equals the absolute value of x is something like this. And at x equals naught, we can't determine the slope. We've got a sharp point there. We can determine the slope at other places when x is not equal to naught, but not at that point. These two conditions, continuity and smoothness, are actually combined in the Newton quotient. So f prime x naught exists if and only if, so that means it's a necessary and sufficient condition, if and only if the limit of delta y on delta x exists at x equals x naught as delta x approaches zero. There are various ways to denote a derivative. dy dx, dfx dx, or something similar there ddx of fx, f prime x we've come across, y prime, all of these are quite common. If we differentiate with respect to time, dot notation is often used. So we would have something like uh, y dot there is the first derivative of the function y. The first derivative is the slope of the function at a particular point. So it tells us whether a function is increasing or decreasing. For an interval i, and taking x1 less than x2, we have these definitions. If f of x1 is less than or equal to f of x2, 
then our function is increasing. Other textbooks might say that it's non-decreasing. In this case, our first derivative is greater than or equal to zero over the interval. If we have a strict inequality for the function, so that f of x1 is strictly less than f of x2, in that case we would have that the first derivative is positive over the interval, then we say our function is strictly increasing. And we have similar definitions for decreasing and strictly decreasing functions. Here are some graphic examples of those concepts. So our first function here is, well, we have a discontinuity and prior to the discontinuity the, the function is horizontal and it's upwardly sloping. So we have a, an increasing function over the intervals where the function is differentiable f prime x is greater than or equal to zero. The second case is a strictly increasing function, so f prime x is greater than zero. And we see there are no horizontal segments there. f of x2 is always greater than f of x1 for any x1 and x2. The third case is a decreasing function. f x is less than or equal to zero. We have that spot there where f of x is equal to zero and the last case a strictly decreasing function first derivatives tell us how functions change with respect to changes in the variable here we go back to the newton quotient so the first derivative is the the rate of change of the function at that point a if we leave out the limit then the ratio f of a plus h minus f of a over h, where f of a isn't approaching zero, is the average rate of change for the function over that interval. Sometimes you might come across the concept of a relative rate of change. So that's the quotient f prime a over f a. That's often expressed as the growth rate of the function at a. This is also known as the proportional rate of change. It's common in economics, and it's usually expressed as a percentage change. Let's finish Module 1 by looking at the basic rules of differentiation. I mentioned earlier that we can find derivatives from first principles using the Newton quotient. In practice, we apply these rules, and the rules that we'll look at in the next module. Here we'll deal with just the most basic rules. A derivative is a rate of change. So if our function is equal to a constant, it doesn't change, and the first derivative is equal to zero. If we add a constant to a function, that constant disappears when we differentiate. If we multiply a function by a constant, it's preserved. If we have y equals c times f of x, then y prime is just c times f prime x. And here we have our most fundamental rule of differentiation, the power rule. If f of x is equal to x to the a, then to get f prime x, we bring down the exponent a and multiply that by any existing coefficient. And to get the new exponent, we just subtract 1 from the exponent of the function. So if we have f of x equals x to the a, f prime x is equal to a times x to the a minus 1. We'll finish the module by applying the power rule to some simple examples. Before we start, we can combine the last two rules. So if we have fx is equal to c times x to the a, that implies f prime x is equal to a c x to the a minus 1. In our first example, c is equal to 1, so that implies that dy dx is equal to, will be 5 times x to the 5 minus 1, which is equal to 5x to the power 4. In the second example, we could rewrite that, that's 1 over 100 times x to the power 100. So dy dx will equal, well, 1 on 100, that was c, times 100 times x to the 100 minus 1. Uh, so that will just equal x to the 99. The third example has the first derivative in a slightly different form, but it's the same process. 
that that's equal to, well, it'll be minus 5 times minus 3, our exponent, times r to the minus 3 minus 1. So that will equal minus 5 times minus 3 plus 15r to the minus 4. The fourth example includes a constant that's equal to a to the alpha p alpha minus 1 plus 0. It's a constant equal to a alpha p to the alpha minus 1. Our last example has a square root expressed as a radical. We can reformat that into a more usable form. So that will be equal to a x to the minus 1 half. So then f prime x will equal minus 1 half a to the x minus 1 half minus 1. And that's equal to minus 1 half a x to the minus 3 on 2.